Hello everyone, welcome to the History Valley YouTube channel. My name is Jacob Berman, and tonight we're going to be discussing Eusebius, the greatest forger in the ancient world, episode one. All right, we're going to start off with the doctrine of Adai, okay? Because that's that's the center of the situation is that document. So let's pull it up over here in the screen. Um, just give me one second. I already got the image ready to go. Okay, here we are. Okay, so there it is on the left. And we got ourselves the Doctrine of Adai. Now, what does this document do exactly? Um, you have this you have this document that is claiming that King Abgar V of Edessa is writing letters to Jesus. Mm -hmm. All right, let's put up King Abgar V real quick, and then let's just let, then let's talk about him some more. Now, King Abgar V is handing over this Mandelian or Mandeline, as some would pronounce it over to Thaddeus. Okay, I'm going to pull up the image to that right now as well. Oh, here he is. Let's make that bigger. Okay. So there he is. Handing the Mandelian, as you can see, below his chest. Actually, uh, in Abgar's uh, stomach area. That's where, that's where the Mandelian is. Um, He's handing it to the guy on the left, which is supposed to be Thaddeus. Now, in some traditions, Thomas and Thaddeus are supposed to be the same character, which is interesting as well. Although in the Doctrine of Adai, Thomas sends Thaddeus um, to do the works of Jesus, and 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 this is actually happening after the crucifixion of Jesus, um, when that part of the story takes place. Um, now we have this problem that the doctrine of Adai is actually never mentioned in the historical record until this guy starts talking about it. And who am I speaking? Who is this? person that I'm talking about that starts talking about it in the 4th century? This guy. Eusebius. Eusebius is the one that starts talking about it. Um, about, this, about the same time the Council of Nicaea starts at around 325 AD, um, Eusebius's works um, were fully written, okay, because he's been in progress of writing these texts for quite a while, and it was Eusebius that first mentions the doctrine of Adai. Before Eusebius ever mentioned any of these letters in the first place, in fact, before Eusebius even existed, before King Abgar V of Edessa was even a thing, um, there's only two historians that mentioned someone called Abgar, and that was Plutarch and Tacitus. Plutarch and Tacitus mentioned somebody called Alcabarus or King Abgar, in the second century. Now, Tacitus says that there was a King Akbaris of the Arabs that was an ally of King Azatis of Adiabene. Now that's a problem because both Plutarch and Tacitus fail to mention that, that either one of the Abgars or Akbars were kings of Edessa. That's omitted from their text. They keep saying that Ivor one's a king of the Arabs. So, that's a problem. We don't have a King Abgar of Edessa until Eusebius starts writing about it. So literally, there is no King Abgar of Edessa um, before AD 70 until Eusebius starts talking about it. It's going to be a little bit complicated, but what I'm saying is... If you look in the late Syriac sources, like the Chronicle of Zuknan or Moses of Koran's History of Armenia, 
we have nothing um we have no evidence of a king Abgar V before AD 70. In fact, there are no kings of Edessa before AD 70. There's no evidence of any of them until Moses of Koran and the Chronicle of Zutnan are around. The Chronicle of Zutnan was written by Yeshua of Estiolite or Joshua of Estiolite somewhere in the, when was it? I think it was either the 7th or 8th century CE. Don't quite remember which century it was. Moses of Koran was writing in the 5th century. So, the latest idea that King Abgar V, I'm sorry, the earliest idea that King Abgar V was the king of Edessa comes from Eusebius and not before. In other words, thanks to Eusebius, we have a long line of, of fictitious kings of Edessa. A tradition started by him. You see, the kings of Edessa before AD 70 um, were kings, uh, let me turn it off, were kings of an Arabian kingdom, which Edessa was not. Edessa was ruled by the Adiabeni kings, not by the Edessan, not by, excuse me, not by Arabian kings. As I've, as I've demonstrated several times before, the Adiabeni kings were descendants of, Tal of the Ptolemaic dynasty and the, and the Hasmonean dynasty. Let me just... Excuse me, I just got to handle that. Okay, there we go. Alright, so that phone just won't stop ringing, so we're just going to keep talking, I'm going to try to talk over it. Okay. So there is no... I'm going to repeat myself. There is no kings of Edessa before 8070 until Eusebius, the Chronicles written into Moses. I think I repeated myself enough on that. I was trying to explain it in different ways, because I don't want the audience to be confused. Okay. Brett Forsyth says, uh... Hero? I, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Dustin says Eusebius is calling. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I guess Arnold Schwarzenegger time traveled him to the future. Or should I say to the present. And, uh, and he's calling me. He's pissed. Anyway. But we're going to Eusebius. We got, some, we got some exposing to do. Okay. Let's pull up a, a chronology of sorts. Because really and truly, this is the only way this is going to make any sense. I need to show all of you a chronology. Okay, so let me get library office writer ready to go. And then we'll get to work on this chronology. Okay, let me put that in web mode. Because that would uh, be of some enormous help there. All right. We're gonna... Oh, well, you know what? There we go. We're right there already. All right, so there's library office. As you can see, we got nothing done on it because so sometimes I like to do this. We're going to work on this together. We're going to watch. Y'all going to watch while I work on this. Okay? Okay. There we go. All right, so I'm going to give an example here. Eusebius writes up, writes the doctrine of Adai, Adai on 325 AD. We're going to underline that, put it in bold. The date's very important there. Okay? Let's get this get that line going there. All right. King Bazus dies 31 AD. Okay? Yes, King Bazus is heavily involved in this situation. I will explain why in a minute. 
Okay. Now, uh, let me look at here. Man Bear says Jesus replied to Abgar reads a lot like John. Well, of course it does. Eusebius read the entire New Testament. He's ripping off the Gospels to create this fictitious fraud of a story called Dr. Medadai. All right, so he's having a fake king but never existed write to Jesus, the mythical Jesus in the New Testament. And Jesus is writing letters back, which he never wrote to begin with because he never received letters from a fictitious king that never existed to begin with. Okay, that was a mess. So, let's get back to the chronology at hand. King Abgar V. Okama is claimed to have died on AD 50 and is alleged to have written letters to Jesus. Okay, we're going to put two sources below him because they tie in the situation. Moses of Corin, Chronicle of Zutnan. Those two sources are claiming, actually, we're, I got a better idea, let's, yeah, those two sources are claiming those things, as well as Eusebius' doctrine of Adai. But those sources depend, see, that's the problem here, those two sources depend on the doctrine of Adai. So we also need to do this. We need to make sure we properly link them together. Oh, okay. Screwed up there. There we go. Those two sources rely on Eusebius. They got nothing before Eusebius, okay? There's everything here. No coins for King Abgar the Fifth Okama. We have no coins to this king. Now here's the interesting part. Guess who we have coins for? This guy. We got coin. We got one coin of them dating to about AD 20. One. And we have the Osri of Helena, Queen Helena, the famous Queen Helena of Adiabene, the sister wife of King Vazus. We got her Osri, which pretty much confirms the Adiabene kings are historical. They existed. Also, we have Josephus' writings, which are first century. That alone confirms that they existed, but the coins are, well, they're of a uh, mighty help. Okay? Okay. So we have a coin for King Bowser's. I just said that earlier. As a matter of fact, we're going to pull it up right here in, in just a minute here. I'm going to pull up the coin. Um... Let me just find an image of it. Here's one from Cambridge University Press. We're going to pull that one up. Okay. Oh, there's Bazus. There he is. There you go. We're going to put you right where you belong. Right there. Matter of fact, if you enlarge it enough, you can actually see Bazios Monobazus written in Greek on there. It's pretty cool. Alright, there's our friend Bazus. Now we're ready to continue. Alright, so he's dead on 31. I just said that earlier. It's right there, right in front of y'all. Now, what does this... Oh, let me link this up forever. Oh. Oh, come on. Get in there. Okay. So what does Bazus have to do with this situation? Well, it has everything to do with it. Because, let me show you all where Eusebius got his ideas from. Bazus writes letters to Izates on 8031, according to Josephus Flavius. Mm-hmm. He did. You know why he wrote those letters? It's because he was dying. He was dying. So now, we're beginning to see what the situation is really about. 
Let's get another line over here, and let's uh, look at another fact. Moses of Corin claims Queen Helena was the consort of King Abgar V of Kama. But in real history, she was the wife of Bazus, not Abgar. You see where this is going? So we have a problem here. This guy's dead on 8050 according to late unreliable sources. But according to 1st century Josephus Flavius, whom we should prioritize, is telling us that this guy down 8031. So we have a problem. Oh, and, and I should say that it was Moses that claims that Abgar had an Arabian ethnicity, which scholars have admitted for a long time is faulty, is untrue. Bazu has no such Arabian ethnicity. As a matter of fact, y'all are going to love this. Y'all are going to love this. There's another fact here. Another fact I wanted to bring up. On about 26 AD, Izates was sent to Charasini, or Charaxini, in Arabia. He was sent there by Bazus, apparently, to start his Nazarene training. It starts about seven years. I think he was sent by Bazus, but whatever. He was he sent himself over there to start his Nazarene training. Uh, Joyce says hi. Oh, hello, Joyce. Okay. So his aunties travels to Charex Spazini to begin his Nazarene training on AD up. Okay, he finished the training on 33. It takes seven years, so it started on 8026. Okay. That's when his Nazarene training actually begins. Let's underline his Zatis there. 8026. All right. Now, the Talmud tells us that Queen Elena also... Uh, went through um, Nazarene training for about seven years. So we all know where this is going. Now remember, Azatis is Bazus' son. He's the son of King Bazus. As a matter of fact, that needs to be understood here. King Manu V, according to the Chronicle of Zutnan, died on AD 57. He reigned for seven years. That's interesting, isn't it? Now, let's get that in this document, okay? Claims that King Manu V reigned for six years. AD, um, seven years, I meant. Seven years. AD, 50 to 57. Oh, come on. There we go. Keep that in mind. That's important. Okay. So, if King Manu the 7th, I'm sorry, I mean not the 7th, King Manu the 6th succeeded King Manu V, and by the way, King Manu VI reigned for 14 years from AD 57 to AD 71. That's, well, one could safely say, historically, that has to be King Monobazus II, because that's the one Josephus tells us about that was ruling about the same time as his king was. Alright. We can conclude from all of that evidence, and since Abgar and Bazus are both writing letters, to Isatis, or, well, Jesus, in later text. They both have the same consort. They're both ruling a kingdom called Edessa, or Adiabeni, both located beyond the Euphrates. Yes, Eusebius actually says Edessa is beyond the Euphrates. Exactly how Josephus describes Adiabeni. It is beyond the Euphrates. That's where he locates it. All right. So now we can begin to see here, we can begin to see here a few facts are starting to form a coherent conclusion. And that we have a coin for Bazus, and we have first century sources mentioning him, 
Fall, none of these things are true for King Algar. None. We know that Akvaris was an Arab, according to Tacitus, so he can't possibly be King Algar V. And if Akbaris is actually the father of the Zatis, that's assuming that he is King Bazus, which he cannot be in the first place, then why did Tacitus fail to mention that Izatis is the son of Akvaris? Why did he leave that out? He left that out. He only called Akvaris an ally of Izatis. That doesn't sound like father and son to me. And Plutarch, whom appears to be writing shortly after Tacitus' Annals is published, tells us that King Algar II, apparently some king in the middle of the first century BCE that's um, helping the Romans against the Parthians, and then apparently he betrays the Romans to the Parthians and he pays for it. I, I don't remember if he's killed or not. I think he, I think he loses a lot of his kingdom. I, I don't remember how that ends. But this is not about him. He appears to be mythical anyway. We got no we have got no coins around. Plutarch arbitrarily mentions him. As a matter of fact, he appears to be an anachronism of the same King Akbaris that Tacitus talks about. Because Plutarch barely offers anything about Akbaris, and it sounds like he's just copying Tacitus and misplacing his reign. Other than that, Plutarch is a pretty reliable historian. But even Josephus makes mistakes too. He made a big mistake about when, uh, Alexander the Great. And he screws up on the chronology of the high priest in, his, in Alexander's life. That's a video for another time. Anyway, back to the topic at hand. Let's re let's go over the facts again one more time, and we'll go, and we're going to go through it much more quickly than we did earlier. We have King Bazus mentioned by first-century sources. We have one coin for him. He writes letters to his son Izates, and he has the same consort Queen Helena of Adiabeni that Abgar has. We have no coins of King Abgar V. He's not mentioned by 1st century or 2nd century sources. He's never mentioned until the 4th century. And late Syriac uh, historians um, change his ethnicity. Based on all that evidence, I have to conclude that King Abgar V did not exist. He's not a historical figure. He's a con job. He's a fraud. A fake character created by Eusebius. For one purpose to legitimize early Christian history. Eusebius is attempting to place the Jesus of the New Testament in the historical record. In order for him to do so, he has to create a, a fake king which is based on, sort of based on, King Bazus. He essentially is King Bazus basically by default. He has Izates replaced with Jesus. So now Bazus or Abgar, the mythical King Abgar, is running to the wrong person. Now, there are several mistakes that Eusebius makes in the Doctrine of Adonai, and we're going to go through them real quick. Eusebius claims that Governor Albinus reigned during the 8030s. We're going to note that right now, just real quick. Eusebius claims in the doctrine of Adai. Let me just space that out a little bit there. There we go. That Governor Albinus reigned during the 8030s. Now what's the problem with that? According to Eusebius, Governor Albinus responded to Emperor Tiberius. Now here's the problem. That makes zero sense. Because according to Josephus, Governor Albinus, which by the way, the translator of the Doctrine of Adai, in the... I'm going to see if I can find it myself while I'm at it. Yeah, the translator of the Doctrine of Adai was Daniel Delino. Um, actually, I think it's I think his last name is pronounced Deliano, so excuse me on that. Let's take a look at what he has to say. Let's read what he has to say about this ridiculous mistake that Eusebius has made. It's, Since no person by the name of Albinus was governor of Judea at the time mentioned in the document, most likely that that his, this name has been confused with that of Albinus, whom Nero made governor 
of Judea, get ready for this, in AD 62. And Daniel DeLiano is absolutely correct about everything he said in that whole sentence. Because Governor Albinus became governor, becomes governor in AD 62. That's a problem. Because how could Governor Albinus be responding? Why would he write letters to a dead emperor 25 years later? And yes, because Emperor Tiberius died in AD 37. So yeah. Come on. That's ridiculous. We're going to note that just real quick. Emperor Tiberius dies. In AD 37. Yeah, so our dear friend Eusebius made a ridiculous mistake. Ridiculous mistake. Now, how did he make such a mistake? I mean, if you read the story of Bowsies, even if you read the New Testament, what on earth does Governor Albinus have anything to do with this? How could Eusebius make a mistake like that? How could you how could you confuse when he reigned? Well, remember. Remember Eusebius read Josephus cover to cover. Is there possibly another Jesus in the reign of Governor Albinus that we're forgetting about here? Is there something that happened during the reign of Governor Albinus that parallels the New Testament in any way? In any way she performed for Eusebius to make such a ridiculous mistake as such as this? Yes. The answer is yes. Because in AD 63, Jesus, son of Ananias, was arrested by the Jews and taken before Governor Albinus. The governor then finds Jesus to be innocent and delusional and thus releases him from custody, from his custody. A.D. 63. Does that sound like something? Does that remind you all of anything that happened in the Gospels? Because it certainly does to me. Even Professor Eisenman noticed it too. What does this sound like? The release, the release of Jesus bar Abbas in the Gospels. Or should I say, parallels the release of Jesus bar Abbas in the Gospels. We need to draw a line as well with Eusebius because, well, that's heavily involved. So, now we understand what Eusebius is doing. He deliberately confused this Jesus for this Jesus. Or should I say, let's move this guy over here real quick to make room for the crucified Jesus. Jesus Christ, the brother of James, is crucified on AD 30. There we go. He is conflating, he is conflating Jesus for this Jesus. Confusing them. Deliberately. And now we know how Eusebius created this con job. Called the Doctrine of Adai. Now we see the problem. And that's why King Edward V must be a fictional, a fake king. He did not exist. At least as described by the late sources. Yeah, you could technically say King Bazius is Abgar. I mean, well, maybe. But... 
I mean, he technically is, but what I'm trying to say is, I've got if it was so fake in the late sources, I mean, look how many mistakes they're making. Practically, it's all being done on purpose anyway. It's a fake king. Fake. Okay. We need to make some corrections here. We need to straighten some things out. Because this is not the only mistakes that these sources make. They make chronological mistakes. As I've already demonstrated. Some major chronolo uh, chronological mistakes. And we need to get through this. They go through each one. Let's see here. We've got seven people watching. We've got five likes. Let me see. How long have I been going at this? Now, it's already been 30 minutes and 52 seconds. Hmm. Okay. Let's go on for a couple more minutes and then, we'll, then I'll head out of here. All right. So let's note a few things that I should have typed in here earlier. Tacitus claims King Akbaris was an Arab and Plutarch mentions King Abgar II who is also claimed to be an Arab. And Moses of Corinth, of course, as I said earlier, is also claimed, claiming that um, Abgar is of an uh, Arabian ethnicity. Okay. Alright. So now we know where Moses made his mistake. Because he confused King Abgar V for King Akbaris of the Arabs. Now it doesn't take it doesn't take a whole lot of thinking here to figure out how this confusion even occurred. Looky here. Let's underline this. Abgar the second and King Abgaris, Akbaris, excuse me, all both claim to be Arabian kings by second century historians. Well <coughs> King Abgar the fifth is being confused for King Akbaris because they have a very similar name by Moses of Koran. However, there's another reason why this confusion took place. And in fact, it's another mistake that Eusebius made, of course. Of course, a lot of every, this whole thing is, is Eusebius' fault, anyway. Okay. Let's go find out what that mistake is. Eusebius claims that Shalmath is the wife of King Abgar V, Okama. Hmm, who is this, um, Shalmath? Wow, that's interesting, isn't it? Because Josephus mentions a very similar one. Let's edit Izatis on the far left, because he marries this woman from Charak Spazini, which is an Arabian kingdom. And he marries Princess Samnatcha. Hmm, that sounds very similar, doesn't it? It sounds very much like Shalmath, doesn't it? Let's make sure we get that in here real clear. Shamath, I mean, Samacha, excuse me, equals Shalmath. Now, notice that there's something very odd here about the name Shalmath. Notice how 
got Al Almath in here. It's kind of odd. You got some match. Uh, I'm like, okay, why would he spell her name differently? Like he's being deceptive in the Doctor Nevada. Well, it's because he's creating a duplicate of this woman, and he's pretending that this woman is the wife of King Abgar V. But we know that King Abgar V is really this guy. So you see the problem here? Shalmath is married to the wrong husband. Her, her marriage has, mo has been moved forward in time, technically, by Eusebius. But in fact, the marriage happened in the early 1820s. It didn't happen in the 80, uh, 40s or late 1830s. It happened in the late 1820s, at latest since the Nazarene training of Azazis ended on AD 20, um, excuse me, on AD 33, the big date, AD 33, um, well, that's the latest year he could have married this woman. Can't be any later than that. And it can't be any earlier than AD 26 either. Nevertheless, regardless of the date, and the, regardless of when the marriage occurred in those seven years, Eusebius got it wrong, and no doubt that he get it wrong on purpose. Now, let's go back to the Gospels. I want all of you to pay attention to this. It's very important. Watch what I'm about to do here. A lot of people say that we need an explanation for the free Magi, free Parthians visiting Jesus in the Gospels. Which, mind you, the Gospel of Mark never mentions, and at least as far as I can remember, it doesn't mention it. And Paul's letters certainly don't mention it. None of them do. The Gospels mention free Magi visited the infant Jesus. And let's draw that line. You see what's happening here? This is more than just Eusebius. Look at what's happening here. Where did the Gospels get that idea from? Remember, the Gospels read Josephus. They read Josephus. Okay? And even consensus scholarship admits the Gospel of Matthew at least postdates the Jewish wars. Although I go further and say all four Gospels po postdates antiquities. But Matthew's using Josephus for sure. And look at the Gospels, mentioning the Magi. Where did they get that idea from? From this. Is out to use Nazarene training on AD 26 is where they got that idea from. You see? The three Magi were actually a parable for Azatis visiting the Parthians or the Arabs at Charak Spazini and marrying Samachan. That's what's really happening here. That's what that story is about in the Gospels. Of course, they weren't visiting Jesus, they were visiting the Zatis. At least the people that they're based on are. And he's not an infant either. He was an adult. He was receiving assistance in his Nazarene training. That's all, that's all that was going on. And you see, like Eusebius, the Gospels are doing the same thing. They shift the roles around. So instead of the Magi going to see Zatis, they're going to see Jesus. Let's not equate Jesus with Zatis here. He's not, they're not the same person. Gotta keep Jesus in the 80-30s. Paul's Jesus is basically King Bazus. But the historical Jesus was crucified during the reign of Pontius Pilate. I say AD 30 because of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the first century version. Um, the first century batch of the Dead Sea Scrolls puts a teacher of salvation. They puts his death on AD 30 or a teacher of righteousness. There's actually different, there's different teachers of righteousness. There's multiple people called that um, in the scrolls. Um, I'll have to get more to that, more into that in later, later videos. That's way, that's way too much to talk about here in one video. 
Okay. Um, of course, there's also something that I'm developing on my own. There may be a twist to Jesus' crucifixion. I'm going to save that for later. Um, anyway. Okay, so we got Bazus dead on 31. Who succeeds Bazus? Who becomes the next king? Now, this is a situation that's really odd. Josephus tells us that Azatis is to be king, but the problem is he's over there doing his Nazarene business. And the problem is Nazarene training is very picky. Okay? You can't you can't pause at all. You do. You make one mistake, you gotta start over. You gotta do it all over again. See so oh man, poor you. You're just about to finish your training after seven years, but you gotta do another seven years, man. That would suck. And Azatis is not about to make that mistake, even if his father is on his deathbed. So he's going to finish his training. He's going to finish his training. He's going to finish his seven years. He's got two more years to go. However, Josephus doesn't make that clear. He doesn't tell us when the Nazarene training actually started. So how did I figure all that out? We know that Bazus dies in 31 AD, but we don't know when the Nazarene training for Azati started. Actually, there is a way to know. The Chronicle of Zutnin is mostly reliable. In fact, much of the information about Odessa that it mentions is correct. At least if it, when it comes to, well, late 1st century kings of Edessa, 2nd century and 3rd century kings of Edessa. But anything before that, before the last quarter of the 1st century, the Chronicle of Sutton is wrong. We have to account for the mistakes in later sources. Because in this methodology, we need to prioritize 1st century sources. Not 5th, not 6th, not 7th, not 8th centuries, or 4th centuries, or 1st century sources. We need to be prioritizing 1st century sources. 1st century sources. Because we're talking about 1st century events. The latest I will go is the last quarter of the 2nd century. I'm sorry, not last quarter, the 1st quarter of the 2nd century. Like Tacitus and Plutarch, that's as far as I'll go. Even they are already making... Already starting to get a little odd there, okay? So, gotta be a little careful. That's as far as I'm going. But anything beyond that, no, not happening. Okay, let's get back to the story. Alright, remember what I said here, okay? King Manu V started his reign on 50, and he's supposed to be dead by 57. The next king after him, okay, the next king after him is King Manu the sixth. King Manu the sixth. So we're going to put him in here real quick. Reigns from AD 57 to 71. We're going to link him to the top because that's part of Chronicle of Zutnan. Zutnan's making that claim. Now we have this problem here. The model Vaz is the second. Model Vaz is the second. Is given security by Emperor Vespasian on AD 70. All right, let's think about that just for a second here. So we have confirmation from Josephus because Monobazus II is given security by Emperor Vespasian. But that's it. <laughs> I mean, he's the king, Manu VI. But the problem is, Josephus is kind of vague. If we were to take Josephus' account, account of things by himself and ignore the Chronicles even completely, which we cannot do, then, as far as, as far as Josephus is concerned, Azatis died on, well, it appears to say, it, it wants to do the math, because he actually gives you 
uh, reign lengths of Azates. He says, oh, he, he lived a 55-year life and he, and he reigned for 24 years. Okay. So based on the fact that Bazus dies during the reign of Emperor Tiberius, as Josephus makes clear, that put his death somewhere between, I don't know, 30, uh, 30, 33 AD, 31 AD, somewhere around there. And it puts Azati's death around 55 AD, depending on how you work it out, but it's going to be vague. That's odd, and that's not good enough. If the Chronicle of Zutnan, if, if the kings of Odessa are the kings of Adiabeni, and if King Agar V is a fraud, but we have confirmation that all the kings of Edessa after King Agar V are historical kings. If we have an Osri for Queen Elena, if you have a coin for King Bazus, then that means these kings are historical, but their history is being manipulated by church historians. That's the facts that, we've, that we are able to assemble here based on the overwhelming evidence. So, let's pull up the Osri of Queen Elena of Adiabeni real quick. Something I needed to do earlier. Oh, that's way too big. Okay, wow. Let's make that... Let's make that much smaller. Osri of Queen Helena of Adiabeni. Okay. So we know she existed. I mean, well, much less Josephus mentions her. I mean, yeah. I mean, she's, she existed, no question about it. Overwhelming evidence. Now, according to Josephus, she appears to have died after Azati's dies. And I'm not positive, there may be something fishy about the chronology of her death. And I'll discuss that in a future video. But, if we take it as it is, he dies on AD 50, she dies on AD 57, or 55, around the same time as Azati is supposed to die. But, we'll, we'll put on the chronology a little bit later. The one thing we do know for sure is Azati does die in the mid-50s due to the overwhelming evidence. Now, how do we figure this out? Okay, so if we if we take Josephus as is, then Azatis dies on 55. Just about 55 AD. The problem is, Azatis' Nazarene training wasn't finished on 31 AD, and Josephus tells us that King or Prince Monobaz II is to take his place as king until he returns. But the problem is, we don't know how much time that is. Because Josephus doesn't tell us how much time that was either. So that's annoying. How do we account for the missing information here? Well, let's go back to the Chronicle of Zutnan real quick. The Chronicle of Zutnan claims that King Manu V reigned for seven years, from AD 50 to 57, while King Manu the sixth reigned for 14 years from AD 57 to 71. Josephus says King Azates reigned for 24 years after his Nazarene training was completed. Completed. But during the final years of his training, King Monobazus II was appointed, actually I should say Prince Monobazus II was appointed as king until Izates, Prince Izates, returned to Adiabeni. All right. Oh, I didn't mean to pull that up. Okay. Let's take all these facts that we have right here real quick. All those facts. And let's take let's, let's do some basic math. 
So if Bazzi is down 31, and if King Manu the seventh, uh, not the seventh, the sixth, died on 71 AD, if uh, well, because we know King Manu the sixth died on 31, uh, 71 AD, this actually becomes simple. So we know King Edward V, aka Bowser, did not die on eighty fifty. He died on thirty one. Because the reign was 20, 24 years, I can prove it down thirty one. So let's do some math. So if we do twenty four minus fifty seven AD equals 33 AD. Oh. Oh, I see. As all of you will see here, it all clicks in. Like that. Bazus died on 31 AD. Why? Because 31 to 33 AD are the missing years of Izati's Nazarene training. There we go. See how simple that, that was? So those are the two missing years. It's actually two years are missing. That was the problem. We have two missing years in the chronology of Izati's. But that just got fixed. So, now we can say Izati's, Prince Izati's, completes his Nazarene training and returns with Ananias to Adia Beni. Let's make this a little bit more visible. Let's get this guy in here. There we are. Zatis completes his Nazarene training and returns to Adia Beni on AD 33. And then Manobazus II relinquishes his temporary rule as king. That's because he was not the rightful heir. Zatis was appointed the, right, the rightful heir to the throne by his dying king, my father, King Bazus Manobazus of Adiaveni, back in 31 AD. And then he reigned for 24 years. Izates, King Izates, dies on AD 57. Let's get this in there. Okay, that was uh, odd. Okay. Hold on, let's get this line properly lined up here. Okay. Ah, uh, screw it. We'll just leave it like that. Okay. 1057. Then King Monobaz is two. Prince Monobaz is two, I meant. Succeed him as king. So there we go. That solves the problem. And then we can... Put King Manobaz's II dying on 8071. And then, after that, all the other kings of Edessa are historical figures. King Abgarva VI, for example. King Abgarva VI, you see, this can be explained. The Tarek Spazini kings are obviously the King Akbaruses talked about by Tacitus and Plutarch. You see, kings of Charax Spazini are the Abgars and Akbaruses mentioned by Plutarch and Tacitus. Put all that evidence together, and guess what happens? We have our Arabian ethnicity. There we are. There we got Shalmath coming out of Samatcha. It explains his entire confusion. We got a King Akbaris 
running around 80 49 helping as Azati's dealing with issues in Parthia we can explain all of that let's get Akbaras back in let's get him in here real quick they are the kings of Charak Spazini that's why it's a vague Arabian kingdom the coins we have of the Charak Spazini are pretty much all the evidence we have of the kingdom anyway, except for some vague mentions by Josephus Flavius. <laughs> but I mean vague as hell. He barely says anything about the Charax Spazini. It's the same amount of vagueness we see by uh, we see in Plutarch and Tacitus' works. There we go. This is it. This is how Eusebius masterminded this entire situation. And look at the damage he's done. Look at the damage he's done. But also, thanks to the Chronicle of Zutnan accumulating both faulty and accurate information together, we were able to deconstruct Eusebius' nonsense. What's interesting is the Chronicle of Zutnan filters out some of the mistakes that Moses of Koran made. The whole Arabian stuff. Just a little bit. Zutnan corrects Moses but makes mistakes in other places. And let me tell you something, Moses made some very serious mistakes. Like, take Ananan. That's Ananias, Ben Ananias, the guy that killed James. Discussed him a lot in the past. He's called Abgar's son. Back then, I didn't know that was a mistake. I thought it was evidence, but I realized it was a mistake. Josephus, okay, Moses read Josephus, and he confused... He actually confused Ananan for Azatis. I don't even... Uh, actually, no. Not Azatis. He confused him for Monobazes. He actually thought those two guys were the same person. And it's ridiculous. Monobaz is alive on 8070, um, um, accepting Emperor Vespasian's personal security to get him out of, zeal, uh, out of harm's way from the Zealots, to get him away from the Zealots, after Jerusalem was uh, conquered by the Romans. Well, Ananias, Ben Ananias died two years before. Oh, and how does this mistake originate? The Dr. Nevadai again. Always the Dr. Nevadai here. Mostly. What does the Dr. Nevadai say? Well, let's go to the end. Let's go right to the end and find out what it says. Let's take a look. What do we have here? Oh, that's what happened. Agai. What happened to poor Agai? He got he got killed. And Paulet was involved in his death. Oh, Paulet. Does that sound like Paul? Remember, Eusebius read the recognitions of Clement, written around 150 AD, which claims Paul killed James. Of course, the, the Clementine Christians fought Paul as Ananias. I've discussed that in the past. Clementine Christians believe Paul is Ananias, but Ananias. That's why they got Paul killing James, doing everything that Ananias does. And in a way, Paul, the historical Paul, is also mimicking Ananias too. All you have to do is read Josephus and parallel Ananias and Ananias to Paul the Apostles of Life, and you kind of see the problem. Of course, in reality, Ananias taught Paul. He was his tutor. But you can see how Ananias becomes the apocryphal Paul. I'm not saying he's Paul the Apostle. There's a big difference there. The apocryphal Paul. In the future, I do want to come on Myth Vision and explain all this. That way, that sets the record straight. Um, the way I presented Ananias and Paul came out wrong, and I need to fix that. But I'll tell you what's not wrong. The Clementine Christians confuse Paul and Ananias, and we have lots of evidence for that. Lots. Lots and lots and lots of evidence for that. Okay. So Agai is killed pretty much by Paulette. 
And Paul, I'm sorry, you see Beatrice is like, oh, so the Doctor of Eye says Paul that killed Agai, then you got um, something like that, and then you got Recognition saying Paul killed James, and Recognition is far less ambiguous about it than the Doctor of Eye is. And you see Beatrice takes it and thinks, well, then let's say Paul, Paul and, 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 and Anais are the same guy. Actually, I'm sorry, that was Moses who coordinated that, not Eusebius. Eusebius is the one that created the Paul of killing Agai thing. Moses was the one that did that. But Moses got the idea from reading Eusebius, Eusebius is Dr. Nevadai, from reading the Clementine Recognitions and from reading Josephus all at the same time. And he created this major confusion in his own work. And now, and now then is a, com is a composite figure of Monobazus II, Ananias ben Ananias, Paulet from the Doctrine of Adai from Eusebius, and Paul from Clement of Alexandria's Clements, Clementine Recognitions. He read all those sources and created that con job of the story. And Agai became the new Stephen of Acts. Another pseudonym for James adjust. A stand in for James. And that's how Moses of Corinth created that big time of fraudulent story. And that's what happened. Let's take some questions here. Kwame says, how you link Bazus to Vespasian? Oh, well, I'm not. I mean, I'm linking his son, Monobazus II, to Vespasian. Josephus tells us that Monobazus II was given security by Emperor Vespasian after the temple was destroyed. He says that. It's not a theory, it's a fact. It's exactly what Josephus says. Kwame says, you see, it's linked to the early Christians to the uh, Therapudas, if I'm pronouncing that right. I gotta show how Philo is related to the idea of Benny. I said I would. I'm not getting into that in this video. That's just too much. It's already an hour, two minutes, and 12 seconds long. It's, it's getting long. So, let's wrap this up with explaining the confusion, the further confusion that Moses of Corin has created. Moses of Corin confused Ananias killing James with Paulet killing Agai and with um, the Paul killing James and the Clementine recognitions, and with Paulip killing Agai in the doctrine of Adai. And in result, Moses claimed that Ananan was the king of Edessa during the time period that Monobazus II was actually its king. And claims Ananan killed Adi. Adi is, ha is actually how Moses of Koran refers to us uh, refers to Agai. Have to move up, move all this up a little bit. Hmm. It's a lot of text here. Hold on. Oh, there we go. I should have just done that earlier. Can I fix this? Okay, that's good enough. Um, okay, that's good. Yeah. All right, so that that right there explains much of the confusion in the works of Moses of Corum. And you can see how much of a disaster that is. Um. What's well, probably more correct here is Paul being entangled with the death of Agai, but the way the Doctor of Agai presents it, one can interpret it as killing, uh, Paul killing Agai, so that's not necessarily wrong either. It's a little confusing. All right, that about wraps it up right now. In the second part, uh, the second episode of Eusebius, the greatest uh, uh, forger, Christian forger in the ancient world, um, we'll get into 
uh, more corrections of all of this. Although th that may not be the official title of the next episode, but it will be mentioned as a title in the video, or at least a subtitle. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe and like and share this video. If you really like this video and this channel, and you really want to support it in more ways uh, than I mentioned, then please check out the Patreon and PayPal links in the YouTube channel in the About section or uh, in the description of this video. And um, you can support it financially if you wish. I would appreciate that as well. Thanks in advance, and I'll see you all